thanks for the invitation and, and thanks for being to come tonight. So as if you already know, I'm a microbiologist and then I came from Brazil uh, here to Germany to get or at least try to get my PhD at the Humboldt Center in Munich uh, when I'm running a uh, project related to be microbe. So what I want to do uh, here today is just try to convince you why you also should care about bees and why uh, studying the bee microbiome, so the bee bacteria, fungi, and virus uh, can help to understand the bees issue. Because uh, if you're living uh, in Germany and in Baviera for, 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 uh, Baviera for a while, uh, you already know that there's some movement and some politics related to bees. Uh, so here the people are trying for uh, one million signatures for saving the biodiversity. So today I just want to talk with you a little bit uh, why you also should care and why these people dress like bees, why they're important. You see? Uh, so, uh, first of everything, I want to propose uh, just a uh, uh, really uh, uh, exercise. So, for example, when you go to a supermarket, what's the first product that reminds you about bees? Honey. Right? I think it's more or less like a consensus to everybody. Uh, but what if I tell you that the bees also help to bring different stuff for you? So what if I tell you that uh, kiwi fruit is also brought by bees? That the uh, blackberry, um, the avocado, the mango, uh, apple, uh, melon, watermelon, tomato, oil, all of these products, they have at least a small help of a bee somehow to arrive for you. So in the, the way the bees help to bring this food to you and all these products to you is through the pollination. So the pollination is nothing but the process of bringing the pollen from the male flower to the female flower. So my, it sounds very simple, but for the, for the plants it's really hard because probably you already realize that the plants they don't move that much. So they need a small help. Uh, so the way the pollination can happen is to the wind, to the water, or the more efficient way, biologically. So uh, the plants, they evolve into flower, which are colorful, which are tasty because they produce the nectar to attract animals. So those animals, they came to the flower to feed, and they see that the flower is something different from the rest of the grasses. Uh, and then, without knowing, without realizing, they carry the ball to the different flower, from the male flower to, to the female flower. And then you have the fecundation and you have the food, which is nothing than a baby plant. Uh, so the thing is that pollination can be done, can, uh, happens for different animals, but the thing is that the bees, they're really, really, really efficient pollinators. So as you see here, that's a bubble bee, and it's completely covered by pollen. And the thing is that the same way the plants evolve the flowers to attract the animals, they, the bees, they evolve to be really efficient pollinators. So they have this correlation and this really good relationship with the, with the plants as a well. whole. Uh, so just to give you a, another example, uh, the honeybees, so the ordinary bees that you probably already know, they are responsible for 13% of all the visits in all the flowers around the world. And it changes a lot, so depending on the species, it can reach 85%. And we also have some uh, bees which are specific pollinators for a specific species of plants. So for example, this bee I work with, the, the red basin bee, is a really good pollinator of apple plants. Um, here, just another day, just to show you why, how dependent we are on the pollination. So, the total amount of all the money that is done every year by pollinated crops, so crops which depends on pollinator, it's uh, 200 billion of dollars per year. So, it's a lot, a lot of money. But the thing, and that's probably where I know, the bees are having a really hard time. So, they are dying. They are dying a lot and very fast. Uh, so we have one statistic here, and then we have statistics for all over the place, and depending on the species and depending on the country. Uh, but for example, in 20 years in the US, as the research that was done with six species, we see that they lost around 96% in numbers, so in abundance. And when you uh, check the space for the area they occupy, they lost 87% of the area they used to occupy in 20 years. Which is the loss is almost 100, so they lost almost everything they had. Um, 
And if you check, for example, the commercial bees, so the honey bees, and the, the hive that really produce honey, uh, we have a loss of 40% in the US and 25% here in Europe since 2006. And it doesn't seem too much because in Europe we are not that dependent on pollination and, and this agricultural production as they are in the US, but it's a, a lot of uh, losses. Uh, and the thing is that we are not sure yet what's the process of the death, so what's causing the death of the bees in general, but we know that it's correlated with a lot of stuff, and most of them they are kind of obvious. So the first of them is the, poly is the pollution, as you can imagine, so chemical pollution is also correlated with this death, so uh, not just chemicals, for example, on the, on the, on the, on the water bodies, on, on, the, on the ground, but also atmospheric pollution, and also the increasing uh, use of antibiotics on the livestock. Uh, for, uh, growing. So, and that's why, because when you release this antibiotics in the environment, you create uh, antibiotic resistant bacteria. So, then they're really more strong than the normal bacteria, which infects uh, all the insects and also humans. Um, we also know that intensification of agriculture has a huge correlation with this, and this is also kind of obvious. Uh, but we know, for example, that the use of pesticides really, really bad for the bees. So we have a really fresh new bee. It's important it's because it's a Brazilian new but I will translate for you. So that's when you from Tuesday, so two, two days ago. So uh, they saw that the introduction of a single pesticide was able to, to kill 50 million bees in one month. A single pesticide. So it's a lot. Uh, and we, are, we also know that the increasing monoculture uh, cultivation also has a correlation with this. Why? Because when, when you reduce the diversity of flowers and then you reduce the diversity of plants you are planting, um, you also reduce the options for bees. Because as I told you before, some bees they are really specific for, for some flowers and they really don't want to eat all the other flowers and then they okay, I need to travel three hours to find my flower. So that they, it's, they, it costs a lot of energy for the bees. Um, and in the end, we also see an uh, increasing infection rate for, for different, side, different kinds of parasites. So, not just uh, virus and bacteria, but also some mites. And those mites, this one is called varroa. Varroa mite is really violent and can kill a full hive in kind of one week. And we see that the bees are getting more prone to be infected by this kind of parasites. So, here you can see how devastating this infection is. And it's really hard to treat because it's spread over the, all, all the colonies really fast. Uh, and here you can see when it is infected by a virus. So they are also getting more prone to be infected by the virus. Uh, so one way to study and try to understand what's going on with uh, bees can be done by studying the microbiome. So the microbiome is the full uh, is the whole group of microorganisms which inhabit a living being. So we have our own microbiome, your dog has your own microbiome, and the bees they also have. So we have a lot of uh, bacteria present in our guts, and then they are digesting our food and producing a lot of vitamins for us. And the same happened with the bees. So, uh, and by the way, that's what we do on our research group. We study how microbial populations, how they change and how they adapt when you change any condition in the environment, or in the body, or in the soil, or so, and so on. Uh, and the same happens with the bees. So, for example, we know that the microbiome can provide a lot of good stuff for the bees. Uh, so, for example, the microbiome, so the bacteria, the fungi, and the other virus, perhaps, uh, they can, for example, provide a kind of metabolic complementation. So, for example, if the bee feeds from some sort of sugar or some sort of pollen, and if it's not able to digest this pollen, it can be digested by bacteria. So, in case you don't have a healthy microbiome in the gut, the sugars they accumulate and then become toxic. We also know that a healthy microbiome can provide the proper conditions to ferment in those sugars. So, because the sugars which are the uh, bee feed from the pollen from, and from the nectar, they are digested on the gut, also by the, the gut microbiome, and they, but it, this, this fermentation just happens in a certain uh, acidity and a certain oxygen concentration. So if you change uh, the microbiome, this concentration of oxygen and also the acidity of the gut change, and then the bee is not able to digest it more properly. 
Uh, we also know, and that was shown already in humans, but it's, it's quite clear that it also happened in bee and also in other animals, that some bacteria present on the gut can interact straight with the nervous system we have on the gut, and it has a straight correlation with our uh, central nervous system. So it can change your behavior and the production of some hormones, which is really critical when you get, for example, a larvae. So if you have a larvae that is not having the right uh, expression of the hormones, it doesn't develop properly, so you have a um, sick bee in the future, so a sick adult doesn't develop properly. So the presence of the right microbiome in the very beginning of the life is really essential to the health of the bee. Um, and we also know that certain bacteria, they can give like a boost on the immune system. So and that's what I, what I, what I have an experiment to show to you here now. So in 2017, a group of scientists, what they did was they managed to grow a group of bees without any microbiome. They were sterile. And then uh, they took a picture of the gut of these bacteria. So that's the gut of a bacteria without any microbiome, any bacteria. And then they took this very same group of bees and then they infected with one bacteria, one strain of bacteria. Uh, and they saw that the gut changed. So you have the normal gut here, or actually the gut without any bacteria, and then you have the same gut infected with just one bacteria. And then they saw, oh sorry, <laughs> they saw the production of this scab phenotype. It's, it's like a band of uh, melanin. So it's, it's an intense melanization of the gut which is triggered by an intense stimulation of the immune system. So when you compare the two patterns here, so for example, the pattern on the mi micro-free gut with the pattern of this infected gut with just one bacteria, you see that the, the immune system is completely different. So this immune system here is more active, so it's more uh, it's easily def defend from infection easily than compared to the other one. So, that's just to show and exemplify how the presence of just one bacteria can change the whole body. So imagine the whole and the function of a whole microbiome and healthy microbiome with thousands and thousands and thousands of uh, species of bacteria. Um, so the picture we have in the end when we study the, the group, so the bacteria and the microbiome, what we have that's all these chains and all these environmental factors, they like antibiotics, chemicals, uh, climate change, change in the diet, so not having the proper foods and the proper flowers, they have first one impact on the microbial composition of the gut, on what you go to the sorry. And then you have the consequences for it. Because in this case, we are not studying one organism or the other, we are studying the whole island, which is another term that we see to study not just the individual, but the individual and the microbiome, because they evolve together. So you have all these consequences, so like the immune dysfunction, as we saw before, so they get more prone to infect. Uh, you have this metabolic unbalance, so you have accumulation of toxic substances which they cannot digest. Uh, you also have hormone oscillations, as I said before, and the change in the behavior. So, for example, one of the causes that was shown by the, the colony collapse is that the bees, they leave in the morning to get sugar and so on, and they cannot come back to the hive because they don't know where, where they are. And then it's caused and can be caused by the change of the microbiome, but we know that's caused by the use of pesticides. Uh, and then you have the impact on them. So, it passed first by the microbial composition, because they have the first contact with the environment from the gut, and then it's kind of uh, goes to me. So, and that's exactly what I'm doing, or trying to do again, uh, in my project. So, uh, we have, that's my bee, by the way, it's the red reason bee, it's not a, it's not a social insect, it has, it's a, it's a wild bee, solitary bee, actually. Uh, so, it has its own cycle, it doesn't have a hive. So we, I'm studying how uh, the change on land use intensity, intensity uh, can change the microbiome on the gut of this bee and try to understand how uh, which kind of traits a healthy microbiome provides for this bee and what's lucky when you have a balanced environment. And these are the our weather station and those are my, my, my tracks. 
and here uh, was over the country. So uh, that's the picture. So that's what we are trying to do, trying to understand how the microbiome and the bee, how they correlate and how the change in the environment also has an impact on the health of the bee. To try to understand which is the mechanism behind right? Uh, but for example, probably if you are worried about uh, your health and our survival because our lifestyle depends on it, how can you help? How can we help like mortals, right? So uh, I should say that Germans and people here, uh, they are doing very well because as you saw before, we have this uh, Save the Bees referendum which claims for more green spaces and less use of pesticides and I, from my point of view, that's the best uh, uh, way to act, so politically, because here you can make the biggest change, as we saw before. So, with the introduction of a single pesticide, can kill a whole population of bees very, very fast. Uh, but even like this, if you want to help on your own, on your own place, and then, for example, for your uh, uh, for your family, you can I don't know start your own garden. It helps. It really helps. Uh, so increasing the diversity of flowers and, and or at least keeping the flowers you already have at the streets or perhaps on your backyard. It also helps a lot. Uh, you can uh, Google uh, how to create a insect pocket or a, a, a house for bees. It, that's, that's, this one is it's quite easy. You just have to hang these little sticks on your wall. Uh, preferentially out, not, not that close to your house. <laughs> uh, but it also helps very much and it's quite easy because they come, you don't need to go after them, they just come. Uh, and you can eat, I don't know, it's a, it's a little tip, but it's probably not that useful, so just don't bring any, any strange species to Germany. And <laughs> you know, so spiders, frogs, and so on, uh, uh, woods, and all of this, because that's important, but that, it's just, just, absolutely, yeah, just not. And you can also encourage people who do green uh, cultivation. So, so people who are not using pesticides, so when you go to the supermarket and you see a green product, I know that's a little bit more expensive, but it really makes a difference because encouraging these people is really important. Because we, what we need to do is a transition for what we are seeing now to something more uh, sustainable. And that really makes all the difference. So, um, Thank you very much. So, if you have any questions, please let us know. Let's take the questions. Are, yes, there is a question here. Is there a microphone in the side? Yes. Great work. Uh, very good. So, is the maximum of bees different, say, in Europe and in the US? And can that explain why bees in Europe survive more? Wow. So, two things. Uh, the microbiome is really specific, not just for the bee, but for any place. So, for example, if you check the microbiome, the microbiome becomes better. So, if you check the microbiome on the soil, and you have a certain microbiome, so if you browse, for example, a piece of pizza, the microbiome changes. So, that's really specific and changes really, really fast. Uh, we don't know exactly why they are surviving more in the US than here, but you also have different factors, not just the microbial, so the weather is, uh, is important. And we know that depending on the country, so the north where you go, the less important the pollination is because you don't have that many crops. Uh, and you also have the, the particularities of, of the population, so it's, it's, it's really a lot of factors at the same time. So I have the feeling that it's not because of the microbiome, so but the microbiome can explain what's happening with the urban population. It's okay? Yeah. Right. Thanks. There is a question that's next. And then, yeah, I have a question on the outside. Yeah, yeah so um, just from what you just said, uh -huh. what kind of climate um, is most susceptible to, like, would be most um, badly affected by the population? Which which climate is like most pollination is more important or most susceptible to be infected? Right. So so like if, if you just said in like northern regions, uh -huh. um, you'll get further more affected by like monkey factors. Yeah. So what's the climate is like more? No, it's just because for example the north when you go, because when you go to the tropics, the agriculture is general speaking. So the, the, the agriculture is more important and more efficient and more fast for than Brazil. The 
have production of food here every year. So if you go to the north, it's not that easy because of the, the weather, so it depends on the season. So, so it's, it's more critical in the tropics. Sorry? It's more critical in the tropics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because just because of the, the for example, the economy in my country is really dependent on agriculture. So for us, it's more critical than, for example, Netherlands. And so, like, do you know what happened to agriculture in, say, Germany? Is like all of this 13 percent of bee, popul bee populations would disappear if all the bees die? Yeah. Well, okay. Yeah, because for what I've shown in the beginning, for example, for depending on the fruits and depending on the plants. Uh, the importance of pollination change. So, for example, what they what they do is to put the hive on the on the farm, and then just the tricks that the bees are doing, they you increase the the rates of pollination. So the pollination can be done manually. But uh, for example, there are some statistics about the world as a whole. I don't think if you need to pay for the pollination, it's like uh, one third of the whole income. So it's like so yeah, probably you can do it manually. Or you can put another insect, but the impact is really, really, really bad. So I think it's better to preserve them than try to remediate really them. Thank you. There is a question here in the third row. I don't know. So my, my question, so we're talking about microbiome, and if I think about my personal one, I can find it on the skin, I can find it in my intestines, they're different places and they differ quite a bit. Um, where exactly do you collect the microbiome from? From the bee? Outside, inside? The gut. So are you waiting for it to come from the pool? <laughs> or do you have to get it? Or what is it work? <laughs> like, if you collect it from the gut, do you huh? wait for the gut to empty voluntarily? Or it depends because it's also it depends the different the question is different. So now I'm working with puppies. So the puppy is the state that comes after the larvae, after the metamorphosis. So this microbiome is like a reminiscence microbiome when from the larvae, that's the really the point where the bee is growing, right? So if you change the, 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 the evolution point of the insect, you change the question. So for example, if I take the microbiome of the larvae. I'm checking what is the impact of, of this microbiome uh, on the development of the hormones, for example. But working with the puppy, that's like a, a hibernation stage. You have a that's, that was proved right, that, that the microbiome is really, really, really stable. So, for example, if you need to optimize some techniques, that's what I'm doing now, optimizing technique because that's really tricky to do. Uh, it's better to use the puppy because for the, when you go to the adult, the microbiome has a huge variance because it depends on the on the, on the on the time of the day that you take, it depends on how much food it has. How do you take it from the microbiome? The answer is that. My thesis in the end is that I have to finish it. Thank you. I think this is a nice note where we'll end. Thank you very much.